It's the world this week, seven days, four Paris-based correspondents, or should we say three and a half. The world this week in partnership with The Daily Beast. Foreign editor Christopher Dickey happens to be on the other side of the Atlantic this week in New York. Thanks for joining us. Well, the half of me that's here is very happy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll be tapping into both halves of you. Uh, with us as well, France 24 senior producer Sarah Bertelson. Hello. Thanks for coming downstairs to the studio. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> All right. Uh, Pierre Aski, President Reporters uh, uh, Without uh, Borders. Hello. You now can hear Monday to Friday on the French public radio station France Inter. That's right. In the morning, uh, international uh, comments. Hmm. All right. Cracking the whip over at Eurosport, Andreas Evagora, the head of news content there. Thank you for being with us. Good to be here. The uh, World This Week on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag World This Week. Exactly one month from today, Brazil goes to the polls and in a nation <clears throat> mired in corruption scandals where the favorite is in jail, the incumbent party on the ropes, now comes an assassination attempt. Former military officer Jair Bolsonaro in stable condition after being stabbed repeatedly in the midsection at a rally by a far left supporter. It happened in the southeastern city of Juiz de Fora. Authorities investigating the suspect's mental health. Bolsonaro, a controversial candidate for his hardline security tax tactics, as well as his uh, statements about blacks, gays, and women. Second in the polls, his support seemed to have plateaued. But what about now? I have a message for the criminals who tried to take the life of a family man, a man that we expect to be the father of millions of Brazilians. You just elected the president. He's going to win in the first round. You just elected the president, Pierre Aski. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's a strange election campaign because we ha first had uh, Lula, uh, the former president who is in jail, who was prevented from... Uh, Registering his candidacy was rejected by by a court. Now we have this uh, um, uh, candidate uh, that is stabbed, and as your correspondent said earlier, uh, it's going to uh, be a, a boost for him because apparently he's very bad in interviews, and and he, he will be prevented from giving interviews. So it, it's a strange campaign, and and I must say, Brazil was a few years ago the the, the beacon of uh, Latin America with the. A uh, uh, bright uh, upcoming <clears throat> economy and uh, and leaders that that were you know, shining all over the world and today the the political uh, spectrum is is pretty gloomy I must say just a few days ago Christopher Dickey in this very studio we had guests from Brazil saying look Bolsonaro's gotten about as as much support as he's going to get he can't be president what about now. Well, I think it's hard to predict, but I think it, this will certainly work to his benefit. I think the report from on the ground in Brazil was probably very accurate. Uh, this is going to get him a sympathy vote. It's going to mean that he doesn't give horrible interviews that will actually damage his ca candidacy. Uh, and in this chaotic environment, uh, I think the voters really don't trust anybody. There, and there is a tendency, certainly we've seen it in Europe, we're about to see it in Sweden, uh, for far-right uh, politicians to gain ground. So whether he will win in the first round, I'm not sure, but it does look like he will have a good shot at getting into a second round. And, and there's the military background and the political incorrectness of Bolsonaro. Yes. But I, I, uh, I, I'm starting to think that, you know, once we talked about politics being boring, and that was maybe a good time, because now we, over the last uh, years, we've seen election campaigns in all over the world being soap operas and you know with but now with very real victims so it's uh, it, it's it's sad and we see the you know politics uh, is getting more and more polarized and and you know this time in Brazil we're seeing uh, the same thing as we've seen elsewhere you talk about nostalgia Sarah Bertelson for some kind of golden age uh, sources tell the Reuters news agency that after Thursday's rejection of Lula by the Supreme Court He's going to be next Monday handing over the baton to his running mate, former Sao Paulo mayor Fernando Haddad. Haddad who's trying to emerge from all the chaos. The people are asking for that time back when people had confidence in the economy 
had confidence in the country, had confidence in its institutions, when Brazil was heard on the international scene. How do, you, how do you rebound from the chaos that Brazil is mired in right now? It's going to be fascinating to see the impact of, of political violence because uh, well, we, we condemn, obviously, uh, the act yesterday. Uh, this is not someone who's looking to, to dampen sentiment and bring about uh, a, a lot of peaceful sentiment in Brazil. Yeah, our correspondent was saying the profession, uh, what, his, his running mate saying the professionals of violence are us. Well, he's, he said a policeman isn't a policeman unless he kills people. So, you know, that's, that's pretty violent. But relating it to, to my home country, uh, the last political assassination um, in Britain, Joe Cox, in 2016, a lot of people thought, well, it would bring her some sympathy after what happened. She was murdered by... Uh, she was for, for Remain. It was in the build-up to exactly. that Brexit vote. Uh, she was uh, assassinated by someone from the extreme right. Um, but it was kind of used quite cleverly by the extreme right um, to undermine uh, her family, to undermine what the kind of society she was talking about. So it's not necessarily going to work in, in a favour that, that we might expect. For instance, in Brazil, will some people fear going back to the bad old days of violence, will they think, is this the kind of society we want to go back to? Will it work against this candidate? Or will they say, as some of your correspondents have said already, that it will give them a big sympathy vote? We'll see that uh, once the election comes. It could play both ways, Christopher Dickey. Yeah, it probably could play both ways, but I, I feel that the omens are not good on this one. Uh, and I think the real problem in Brazil is that you had a country that was rich, that was, as Pierre said, a sort of a beacon for all of Latin America. And for the last couple of years, it's been totally mired in uh, corruption scandals, where everybody, uh, from former President Lula, who's now in jail, to the uh, parliament that, uh, that basically threw him out, uh, has been accused of very, very serious crimes of corruption. So at the end of the day, I think that the, the faith of the electorate in these politicians is very low. And that's when the electorate starts to reach for the extremes. I think that's always a danger. Which brings us to uh, the political climate where you are right now. The book is <laughs> called A Fear, the latest tome by longtime Washington Post investigative reporter Bob Woodward. It chronicles chaos inside the Trump White House, hits the uh, bookstores next week, citing numerous sources, excerpts by the journalist who helped break the Watergate scandal wide open, include Plenty of the same backstabbing anecdotes as in Michael Wolff's Fire and Fury. This time, added to it, are tales of senior staff members effectively trying to save Trump from himself. According to Woodward, his uh, former economic advisor, Gary Cohn, stole a letter off of Trump's desk that the president was intending to sign to formally withdraw the U.S. from a trade agreement with South Korea. Cohn later told an associate that he removed the letter to protect national security and that Trump did not notice that it was missing. Pierre Aski, your reaction to all of this? It's, you know, on one side, it's completely mad. I mean, we, we, we have a, a madhouse uh, in, the, in the White House, and, and it's, it's unreal to watch this from, from afar. On the other side, I wonder uh, if Trump is not winning out of it, because uh, the amount of attacks that he's uh, going under, whether it's from this anonymous letter from one supposedly uh, high responsible uh, in, in the administration or from uh, Woodward, the Washington Post and the mainstream media, uh, play into the, the victim of the system, play into the, the, the plot mentality that he's been uh, working on for, for months. And, and I'm wondering whether all this is not backfiring into uh, uh, making the, the, the ground uh, voters of Trump holding. I, I was watching, uh, the, there's a news website in, in the US, uh, 538, which collects all the opinion polls. And you look at it and, and it still has 40% support in, among American voters after everything that, that has been said about him. And that's about the same as Ronald Reagan or, or Bill Clinton at the same time. And, and, and I don't think those 40% voters will be very much uh, affected by what is being published by the Washington Post journalist or uh, in the columns of the New York Times. Uh, Chris Riddicki, the difference this time is that the book is by Bob Woodward. And we had one panelist earlier this week say 
He's one author whose books are bought by those who vote Republican and Democrat alike. Well, I think that's true. I mean, his, he, he goes way back. His first book was uh, with uh, Carl Bernstein, was All the President's Men, uh, inside, uh, looking deep inside the Nixon administration uh, and leading up to Watergate, and then the final days, and then the Supreme Court, and then book after book after book, in which he conducts hundreds of interviews. I have to say, usually there are two or three key sources who really lay things out for him, and then he confirms uh, those pictures with other interviews. Uh, but his stuff has been very reliable, and people always complain, oh, well, I, I didn't say that. And then later on, they often admit that, yeah, they did say that once they're out of power. So I think it's a pretty accurate picture of what's going on inside the administration. And uh, as somebody summed it up, it's a superpower run by a simpleton uh, who is also one, a man given to huge fits of anger. Uh, and is very difficult for his staff to deal with, but who also doesn't know much about the rest of the world and has a few simple ideas that he pursues relentlessly and probably to the detriment of the United States. But for the moment, uh, Trump is still able to coast on the economic prosperity that was built up under uh, President Obama, who, by the way, has a 66 percent approval rating. Yeah, and has been saying uh, this Friday that uh, Donald Trump's presidency is a symptom, not a cause, Andreas. Yeah, I, was, I was reading this um, new word that's trending, lodestar, because that was apparently gives us a ah. clue about who wrote this article. Now, if it was Mike Pence, apparently he's the only man in America who uses this word, Christopher, maybe can confirm that. But if that's the case, he'd be a bit naive to put it in the op-ed which suggests that Mike Pence has plenty of enemies as well. So either way you look at it, it's, it's kind of confusing. But I've got to say it's a bit rich for Trump to talk to, to criticise anonymous sources because you remember the New York Post, page six, you're in New Yorker, you've read that page. And uh, he was famously, he used to call in himself, pretending to be other people. He'd get his aides to call in, put on funny voices, give them an anonymous, anonymous tips and bits of gossip. So... He can't really be complaining too much about the use of anonymous sources. Yeah, I must admit, I too uh, was was going to my dictionary the other day, confession here, uh, to look up what lodestar meant. And yes, it is true that the vice president does use the word quite a bit. That's going to continue to be a lodestar. Jack's lodestar. As our lodestar. Lodestar. It really was the lodestar. Uh, lodestar, which means a, a shining light, a person who leads or... Yes, and it's, it's a Swedish word, I think, from the beginning. Ledstjärna, it's the same word in Swedish. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it was a Swede writing this. No, but I, I, I saw an interesting article as well that the, the, BBC, um, the BBC run this article through some kind of software that analyzes and compared it to other statements that have been put out by the administration. And, uh, well, they came up with the same conclusion, that uh, it looks very much like Mike Pence, but at the same time, I don't think they're that stupid to make it too obvious. So do you buy Andreas's theory that it's somebody trying to trip up Mike Pence and therefore putting the word in? Anyone who has watched House of Cards can believe anything <laughs> about, about American <laughs> politics. <laughs> Christopher Dickey. Well, I think probably it's not Mike Pence. Uh, and it's likely that, I don't think it was necessarily a conspiracy either. It may be somebody who was listening to Mike Pence a lot, maybe somebody on Mike Pence's staff. As we point out in the Daily Beast today, senior administration official, that covers a lot of ground in Washington. Everybody is a senior administration official. So the idea that this is a cabinet member or the vice president of the United States is probably misguided. My favorite denial, by the way, you saw the dozens and dozens of denials, I didn't say it, it wasn't me, was actually from Melania Trump, that she felt constrained to say, no, she wasn't jerking papers off of the, uh, off of the desk of uh, her husband, and she wasn't trying to protect the United States that way, uh, and of course calling the person who did write that column in the New York Times cowardly. Christopher, I want your reaction to another denial, and this one coming uh, from the U.S. Secretary of State. Let's listen. I come from a place where if, if you're not in a position to execute the commander's intent, you have a singular option, and it's to leave. And this person in Chad instead, according to the New York Times, uh, chose not only to stay, but to undermine what President Trump and this administration are trying to do. Do you agree with Mike Pompeo, Christopher? 
Well, up to a point. I mean, I think when I read it, uh, I was struck by the idea that this was a really cowardly position to take. If you really feel this way, resign. Don't try and tell me you're an anonymous hero protecting the United States from the president of the United States, who you serve, uh, while he also is serving the Republican agenda. This is clearly a Republican position uh, the, being taken by this anonymous uh, columnist because he's saying, you know, we, we're getting our Supreme Court justices, we're getting our tax cut, those are all good things. It just so happens the president is insane, you know? I think there's a point at which Republicans ought to stand up and say, yes, the president has gone nuts, he's out of his mind, and we need to do something about it, like take him out of office. But that's not what this guy is saying. This guy is saying, keep him in office, but we, the resistance, will keep him on a steady course. Do you agree with Christopher Sauer? I, I don't know. When I read the when I read this, I yes, it was both. Uh, I felt both. You know, it's it's we go through strange times after all everything we've gone through with uh, with Donald Trump. Uh, at a the house same of time, cards moment. Uh, yes, but at the same time, it's a bit reassuring to hear that there is an adult in the room. I must say, after you know, uh, everything we've seen. So. Um, uh, I, I think that the, the thing is that Donald Trump, as you pointed out, he still has a, a good support in, in, the, in the public. So, I mean, uh, he will be there for, for still some time to come. The, the, the problem is that uh, I think there was a, uh, um, there have been lots of attempt to get him out, you know, uh, talk about impeachment. Now talking about this 25th Amendment uh, that we, I, I must say, I didn't know about. And, and now uh, everybody's an expert in the 25th Amendment. Uh, and, and it's true that if this man or, or woman, because we, we don't know, uh, uh, had come out with all, uh, you know, in the open with all the elements about the unfit nature of Donald Trump to lead this country, maybe it could have started a, a process. But the anonymous uh, and the and this idea that we are going to resist from inside uh, uh, by protecting American interests. Uh, uh, against the president uh, weakens that that argument that that uh, uh, institutional uh, guarantees are going to save America. The, the weakening of uh, U.S. authority. We're going to pick up on that point when we come back. Stay with us. You're watching the world this week. Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's The World This Week, The World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast, Christopher Dickey at HQ this Friday in New York City. Welcome back. Welcome back as well to uh, Pierre Aski, president of Reporters Without uh, Borders, Andreas Evagora in charge of news content at uh, Eurosport, and uh, Sarah Bertelson, senior producer here, France 24. Uh, just before the break, uh, we were talking about the undermining of, of U.S. authority on the world stage, a point that Pierre Hasky made, um, Donald Trump, who's asked for an investigation by the Justice Department into who wrote that anonymous uh, piece. Uh, Christopher Dickey, uh, in the Daily Beast uh, this Friday, there's reporting that officials at the Justice Department were fist bumping each other after the article was published. Well, apparently so. I mean, they feel that uh, they are also holding the line, holding the fort against the insanity of the president of the United States, which is a pretty scary proposition. You know, I think these are really perilous and frightening times here in the United States, at least here on the eastern seaboard. Maybe out in the middle of America, people feel content to have uh, Donald Trump ruling the country and they think everything's going, on, going fine. His supporters in the South might think that too. But I ran into uh, General uh, Michael Hayden the other day, who was the um, director of the CIA and director of the NSA uh, at various stages under the Bush administration, the George W. Bush administration. And I asked him, how does America get out of this? And he said he thinks it'll be a disaster uh, if uh, Trump is removed from office uh, between now and 2020. He thinks 2020 is the only way to do it because as he put it, uh, this former spy chief, if he is removed, then about 30 or 40 percent of Americans are going to believe that there was a coup d'etat by people like him, by the so-called deep state. And Trump is laying the groundwork for that every day. This thing like the letter in the New York Times, the op-ed in the New York Times, and the Woodward book only confirm that argument in the minds of his supporters. Yeah, you talk about his supporters in Billings, Montana, Thursday evening, Donald Trump addressing a crowd of 10,000 of them 
and uh, seeming, at least during his speech, to take it all in stride. So I beat all these senators, all these governors, all these brilliant political minds. Then I beat the other side. And then I listen. Is he competent? I think I'm pretty competent, right? Don't you think so? Is he competent? And that, Piaski, that was your initial point. Yes. Yes, and I think, uh, uh, you know, what we are witnessing in the U.S. is actually a, a world phenomenon, is the polarization, extreme polarization of, of the spectrum. And, and we have someone like Donald Trump who's probably playing on that so much better than anybody else. And, you know, I was struck by the fact that uh, on, uh, two days ago, he appeared in front of the cameras after the New York Times piece was published, and he said, no one can beat me in 2020. And I was wondering, what if he's right? Uh, what if uh, uh, all this is playing into his game, into his hands, uh, by showing that the establishment doesn't want somebody like him? And that is sweet to the ears of a, a good 40% of, of Americans. And that's a, a very important thing that I think we are witnessing in a milder way in Europe, although it's getting uh, tougher here too. And we'll be talking about it in the case of Sweden in a moment. Um, that's not all, by the way, that Donald Trump's been talking and tweeting about this week. Uh, on Thursday, he put out uh, uh, this missive. What was Nike thinking? His response mm -hmm. Uh, to the ad that uh, the uh, popular shoe and sportswear brand unveiled for the start of the NFL <clears throat> season, an ad that features Colin Kaepernick, the former San Francisco 49ers quarterback, who's been out of a job since taking a knee during the national anthem as part of Black Lives Matter protests against police brutality. Believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. If you have only one hand, don't just watch football, play. And if you're a girl from Compton, become the greatest athlete ever. Yeah, that's more like it. So don't ask if your dreams are crazy. Ask if they're crazy enough. Andreas Evagora, how much of a risk is Nike taking here? Oh, I think it's a big risk. I mean, let, let's be honest. Of course, it's a publicity stunt. Of course, it's done to sell more shoes um, and sell more equipment. But they're taking a big risk because they can't really control the the backlash from this. Obviously, people have been burning their shoes uh, online and so on. Uh, but I would applaud them despite that because they're taking this risk. And, and I think people forget, you know, why is this guy in the news? He made a statement against anti-racism. He, he's not a criminal. He's not a killer. He's not a dope cheat. He simply said that he's against racism and expressed it in his own way. Now, that should be one of the least controversial things possible for a professional sportsman to do. Uh, as you're alluding to, he was in the middle of a, of a $100 million seven-year contract, and he's out of a job. He's not a poor man, but nevertheless, he can't practice his profession anymore. So in that way, I would applaud Nike. They are taking a risk. Um, I think they're perhaps thinking from the political side, is this the tipping point where Donald Trump's popularity might be on the wane? It's a big risk, and let's see if it, if it, uh, if it works out. All right, among those featured in the ad, uh, tennis great uh, Serena Williams. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, he's done a lot for, you know, the African-American community, and it's cost him a lot. And, you know, it's, it's sad, but he continues to do the best that he can to support. And... Um, having a huge company back him, you know, through, you know, it could be a controversial reason for this company, but they're not afraid. And I feel like that was a really powerful statement to a lot of, a lot of other companies. What, what are you thinking when you listen to Serena Williams, Sarah? But I would like to think that this is a strong statement and that, as you said, that this is taking a big risk. But I'm, I'm a bit more cynical about this. I think this is, a, this is excellent promotion. This is excellent PR work, uh, well executed, beautiful. The, the clip is, is really, you know, it's really, really well done. Uh, but I don't, I think they're in, they're in for selling stuff. 
uh, Nike sells um, sells equipment and shoes and clothes and uh, I think it's well calculated and um, not so much about convictions as about money. Not so much about convictions, but about money, Christopher Dickey? Well, I think where Nike is concerned, it is about money for sure. It's a business and this is an advertisement. Let's not forget that. But I think where Kaepernick is concerned, it was about conviction and is about conviction. And I think he showed a hell of a lot more courage than the anonymous op-ed writer in the New York Times. He did what he did in public and he took the consequences. If he gets a paycheck now, well, God bless. Piaski? Well, I agree that this is marketing, uh, but it's smart and meaningful marketing. And, and I'd rather see that uh, than uh, those companies pretending to be moral, you know, the do no evil type of uh, slogans. And, yeah, that was uh, Google, right? That was Google and, and doing exactly the opposite. In, you know, uh, at least they're taking a stand in a very hot and controversial okay, so, issue. So here's a philosophical question for you. Can a corporation have a soul? <laughs> when it fits with with its uh, balance sheet, yes, <laughs> and that's that's where the marketing department comes in. Uh, the, I, I'm sure that if the marketing department had said uh, we it's going to cost us uh, so much, uh, they wouldn't have done it. I, I agree that it's completely about the bottom line. It's completely about selling equipment. I wouldn't doubt that at all. But nevertheless, they're the first company who's done it. All the NFL have dropped him. No one wants to go anywhere near this guy. Uh, and I think when history is is looked back on, um, Kaepernick will be seen as being on the right side. You know, he's not the first black athlete to be rejected by corporate America, by large parts of America. So let's see how it plays out. But I, again, of course, it's about Nike selling equipment. But nevertheless, they've made a decision which I think we can applaud. Nike's made a decision. One final question on this, Christopher Dickey. Uh, it's the start of the NFL season. What impact is all this having on American football? Well, I think the initial coverage of a lot of the games is, will people stand uh, during, the, uh, during the national anthem or will they take a knee? How's that going to work out? The players are being interviewed if, they were, if before they took a knee and now they don't or if they sit down. All of that is beginning to, as some of them said, is beginning to feel like a little bit of a distraction. The message is not getting through anymore quite the way it was when Kaepernick uh, was taking a knee uh, alone during the national anthem. But I think, you know, the big question is where are race relations going in the United States? And they're not going anyplace good. And that's because the president of the United States repeatedly endorses the position of not only far right people, uh, but of people who are essentially Nazis. Uh, Obama in his speech today was very clear. You know, it ought to be simple to reject Nazis, to say you don't support Nazis, that Nazis have no place in our society. And yet, and yet, this president fails to do that. He chooses to focus attention on Colin Kaepernick. We're going to talk now about a, a political party who, which has neo-Nazi roots. It's all of Europe on edge ahead of a general election that could see the far right upset the apple cart in Sweden. Uh, the Sweden Democrats polling as high as second, even within the margin of error, to dream of the top spot in Sunday's elections. Our colleagues from partner station France 2 went to Sovesborg, that's near the southern tip of Sweden, a town that's home to a little under 500 Syrian, Afghan and Somali refugees, and where 20% of the population says it will be voting far right. It's come too many. Stop the immigration. So many haven't uh, a good life here. I think they want to be in their uh, own country. And there's uh, so much uh, uh, criminality. All right. And it, one person at one point asked, uh, uh, they're robbing people, although it's never happened to me. Exactly. This is the, what we, we see that most of the people who vote uh, Sweden Democrats actually live in areas where they are not affected uh, by this criminality that they are talking about. Uh, it is an important election coming up in Sweden, and it, we, it really it, it could change, uh, I think, Sweden for, uh, for the coming uh, decades, uh, probably. But it's still, it, we st we're still not quite sure where actually the Sweden Democrats support where it will end up. It could be, as you say, up to 20 percent. It could also, we have seen in the last couple of days that the support has actually gone down. Uh, Sarah, you hail from a country where one in six people are born 
elsewhere. Is, are Swedes nervous about their identity? Do they really feel that... Uh, I mean, there, we have to problem? admit that there is a change in Sweden. When I grew up, uh, and, you know, up until the 1980s, there was very, very few um, immigrants coming to Sweden. Everybody was blonde, blue-eyed, uh, watched the same television shows, had the same history, had the same story. Uh, and since then, uh, the immigration has been quite big. And, you know, now, as you say, a, a, a big chunk of the, of the population has roots elsewhere. We, we don't share the same history. Uh, we don't celebrate the same tradition. So, of course, there is Sweden as a homogenous society, it was created as a very homogenous society, is going towards something different, something more pluralist and uh, maybe multicultural, if that's what you see. And yes, it will, it will be a, a work, or some, some tough job. What, what, what's the answer? Yeah, ask you. I think we, we have to, to think about what's going on at the moment. We have the two uh, countries that have accepted uh, the biggest numbers of uh, immigrants in the 2015 and, and after, Germany and Sweden, going through the same turmoil. Uh, Chemnitz in Eastern Germany had uh, all these uh, neo-Nazi uh, neo demonstrations and so on, and now Sweden with the vote. And these are two countries that are economically doing very well. Uh, Sweden has uh, uh, much bigger growth than, than France. Uh, unemployment is uh, very reasonable. Under Cri 7%. Criminal statistics are not up. Uh, and, and, and the same goes for Germany. It has a, a very good and stable economy. And, and nevertheless, a, a good chunk of the population uh, feels uneasy about this situation. And I think we, we have to think about the, the, what, what failed, what was, was missing uh, from the generosity of welcoming uh, large numbers of immigrants. Uh, I, I don't, personally, I feel these countries were right to do it. And, and, and Merkel uh, in 2015 was admirable in, in her uh, reaction. But the, the backlash is, is incredible and forces us to think what went wrong. And I think these identity issues, identity politics is all over the place in the world today, whether it's in Brazil, in the US, in Europe, in, in the Philippines. And, and, and we have to, we have no answer to, to those questions. And, and certainly uh, mainstream politicians have no answer. And that's the most worrying thing. But doesn't this go back to Trump? Because what's underlying Trump's message is don't believe anyone. Don't believe no. politicians, don't believe teachers, don't believe your doctor. Just don't believe anyone apart from me, obviously. So when you can go to Sweden and Germany, but even other countries, England and France, there are similar sentiments. It, it doesn't really matter whether you point out that there isn't really a link between immigration and crime. People are going to believe it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let, me, let me bring it. Christopher Dickey, on Thursday, uh, researchers at Oxford University uh, published a study regarding the Swedish elections. One out of three articles shared on social media were what those researchers called junk news. Distorted or fake? Well, it isn't just junk news. It's, look, the basic problem is that when you combine anecdotes about crime with latent or blatant racism, uh, you can build a vast popular following because with racism, with xenophobia, those other people, they seem to be very sinister and waging all kinds of criminal conspiracies against you and you can't go out in the street and women will be raped and so on and so forth. Germany, where there were these huge demonstrations or big demonstrations in Chemnitz recently, uh, was, you know, it's that crime is at a 26-year low. Trump came, became president claiming that the Mexicans were sending all their rapists and murderers across the border, and they're still trying to make the case that the uh, undocumented uh, immigrant who murdered, uh, is alleged to have murdered a young woman in Iowa, that he should be a huge election issue uh, in the midterms and in 2020. All of this based on one or two examples. But if you combine those examples with racism, you can make a, make a lot of political momentum out of it. And that's exactly what's happened. And that's what has happened uh, in Sweden. As Sarah was pointing out, the people who are voting for the Sweden Democrats are not the people who are living next to immigrants. They're people who don't even see immigrants most of the time. But they think that there's this sinister dark wave coming in. Yeah, and I just sort of wanted to point, point out that these, these you know, the, the Sweden Democrats exist in Sweden since 1980s, and they have been growing ever since. And it they were boosted by the, the, the wave of 
or the refugee wave in, in 2015, but it didn't start there. It was something that was already growing. And I mean, especially in the local elections, we saw it way beyond, way before the 2015 uh, crisis. And uh, in the past weeks, suddenly, uh, one issue that's overtaken identity politics, according to surveys, don't know if it's true, but that's what opinion polls suggest, is the environment, what with people reeling after those uh, huge forest fires over the summer in Sweden. Sweden saw the, the worst forest fires in its uh, modern history. So, of course, this was something, this is something that really, uh, it was close to home, to say. I mean, you people really noticed uh, climate change and uh, how we need to live with but is it really uh, is it really a campaign issue? Of course it is. What society will we have for the future? Of course, and and the, you know the, 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 the it is an important issue for most Swedes and the old political parties have an environment environmental program, um, but the campaign was for a long time hijacked by this immigrant and identity uh, politics agenda. And so all these issues that, you know, healthcare, um, education system, environment, that all the people really ranked very high in all the surveys, they never got through because media was talking so much about, about immigration and refugees and, uh, you know, criminality. Is it our fault? Is it journalists uh, focusing too much on this? Well, it's not only journalists, as you pointed out. The, 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 the news that are shared on, on social networks are, are not necessarily coming from journalists. Uh, and we have a huge uh, echo chamber of uh, manipulation that's going on. But we run the risk of having every election hijacked by this issue of the migrants because we're only talking about that. And, and we're going to have European elections uh, next May. Uh, and, and the far right and the populist parties are trying to get only one topic uh, of discussion, uh, the migrants. And that's really a trap we, we, we should all, citizens, journalists, politicians, uh, try to avoid. Andres Evagora, you were telling us before we went on air, you were in Greece this summer, mm -hmm. and horrible forest fires that proved fatal in, in one instance. Mm. Um, do you see the environment coming up as a bigger issue than, than, than these other ones that we've been talking about? In, in Greece, not yet. The people I spoke to, they were just coming out of the economic crisis. That's been the big news the last few weeks. There has been a backlash, but it's been a political backlash. Lots of people have been fired in Greece, the head of the police in that area, the fire service and so on. But whether it's becoming an issue as it has in Sweden, I don't see that right now. All right. Fears of an overheating planet, uh, <clears throat> as, as we were saying, not just limited to Sweden. It was the week when France's most popular cabinet member handed the keys uh, to the Environment Ministry over former TV host Nicolas Hulot, who slammed the door of the government live on Pierre Husky's radio station last week after being overruled one too many times inside of Emmanuel Macron's government. That, in turn, this week prompting an open letter calling to save the planet. Uh, that op-ed piece penned by 200 personalities, scientists, but also actors, directors, artists, musicians, and more. Here you're seeing a Facebook page for a rally and a march that's scheduled for Saturday in Paris. A 27-year-old French journalist call on Facebook that's uh, triggered something uh, of a groundswell uh, this Saturday, which coincides, Piaski, with the Rise for Climate initiatives that are taking place uh, around the globe. Do you sense there's a real change here in France on this issue? No. <laughs> no, to be blunt, I don't think so. I think we have a moment of, of emotion because Nicolas Hulot's uh, uh, you know, resignation was very spectacular live on radio. And, and, and it was even more spectacular because, as he told us himself, he hadn't decided to announce his resignation when he came into the studio. And... and he had made his decision, but had not decided to announce it. And he, and he finally, in talking, he decided to do it. So it created really a, a, a shock. Uh, and maybe uh, for a few days, we're, we've been talking about environment, climate change, and that's a good thing. But to be very honest, I think we are still, all of us, trapped in, in this uh, uh, dilemma that we want to solve climate change issues, we want to solve the environment questions, but we also want to have uh, more cars, more uh, energy, more mobile phones, more consumption. And, and so uh, 
our governments are just the the, uh, the reflection of of what we are ourselves and and when there is an arbitration between development and environment development takes over uh, always because because voters will uh, you know everybody's in a short term calculation and and that's the and i don't think uh, we've reached the point yet although the the, the planet is is on fire as is is a, a customary to say uh, we are not reached the point where we have this strong reaction. Christopher Dickey, many of these Rise for Climate initiatives taking place Saturday where you are in the United States, is it getting any attention? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd be even more blunt than, uh, than Pierre in France. Uh, I mean, I think that uh, environmental issues here in America, although people, sure, there are, there is a sizable part of the population that's very concerned about this, but it's just been overwhelmed by the political news and by all the kinds of issues that are pressed all the time by Trump. And, you know, we can make a long list of the things that the Trump administration is doing to destroy the United States of America and the world, uh, according to his critics. And unfortunately, destroying the environment is just one of them. Do you sense a change here in France, uh, Andreas? No, I would tend to agree with oh, Pierre. Dear. Three I mean, no's so <laughs> far. Here we go. The, the pop, but if there is one hope, I mean, the popularity of Hulot came from the fact he wasn't a politician. Mm. So I agree with that. I don't think it's going to come from politics. It, it needs some superhuman guy who's already maybe already popular to just push this agenda forward. Because if you ask people, everyone says, yeah, of course, it's, it's a big worry. But when it comes to doing something about it and voting and changing people's lifestyles, as much as people make an effort, it's clearly not enough. Sarah Burleson? Let me be the optimist here then. Okay, <laughs> great. Oof. I do sense a, a slight change. Uh, I mean, coming from a country where we've been recycling things, well, in Sweden and... Uh, for a very long time, I, I moved to France and I was a bit shocked by, you know, the lack of interest for mm. environmental issues. But I do sense uh, an, uh, more interest now, at least. And, you know, we had this straw thing this summer where suddenly people realized that it's stupid to use straws uh, and stopped using them, left them in the, the bar and, or the hotel or the restaurant. So, yeah, I think there are small steps, very, very small steps, but still moving forward. You know, this, there was something very revealing this week. Uh, Nicolas Hulot said on the radio when he resigned, uh, as long as we are proud to produce the largest, the biggest uh, container, uh, container ship, ships, um, uh, we, we are doomed. And the next day, that largest container ship in the world was uh, inaugurated in, uh, in Le Havre. Uh, and, and you had to listen to uh, every news item on the radio or on television. It was pride, pride, because France had built the largest container ship. And so what, whatever Nicolas Hulot had said the day before was already forgotten. And, and we had this symbol of the consumption society that was uh, being inaugurated with two ministers and, and uh, uh, applauds from everybody. That's All the right. government. I do believe in some kind of civil society movement in, when it comes to The answer to will come from outside of, uh, of government. Uh, we're going to leave it there. But I want to thank you, Sarah Bertelson, Andreas Evagora, Pierre Aski, Chris Dickey, for joining us uh, this week from uh, New York City. Thank you for being with us here in The World This Week. Mm -hmm.